It is a real pleasure to be with you here this evening. Uh, when the bishop's invitation came, my natural inclination, of course, was simply to say, yes, I will come. He is, after all, my ex-diocesan director of ordinance, and basically that habit of lawful canonical obedience dates back at least to 1985, uh, and it would go back further had I known him before then. It's lovely also to be back in St. Helens. St. Helens is my sending church, and I was married, I committed matrimony, more or less there. And it feels like, like yesterday. And the reason why I said that is because this is being recorded, and my wife may well listen to it. <laughs> The passage that we're going to be looking at and, uh, uh, and sitting under tonight uh, is the first of the readings that we, we heard uh, on page nine of the service uh, booklets that you were given as you came in. So that's what we're going to be looking at, these famous words uh, of Paul to his uh, colleagues, his Ephesian elders as he meets them uh, at the port city of, uh, of Miletus. That's where we're looking uh, this evening. If you want to follow it in the, the kind of big Bibles, that's on page 1120 of the church Bibles. And just pause there. What do you think the future looks like for these three friends of ours, Kev and David and Philip? What do you think the future looks like for them? Where do you see them in the years to come? Is your money on one of them to make Archbishop in 20 years' time? Perhaps you have popped down to Ladbrokes already for a quick, early investment at favourable odds. As it happens, I think Kev is worth a quick fiver <laughs> because after teaching him at Oak Hill, I know very well that he is a man who will keep his nose clean, stick to the rules, conform in every kind of way. That's what I recall in my dreams. <laughs> Do you think the next 30 or 40 years is going to be plain sailing for them? With congregations trotting appreciatively into the church every Sunday to listen to the word rightly taught as they have just promised and the sacraments duly administered as the articles bind them. Is it going to be thin-sliced cucumber sandwiches and genteel conversation over the vicarage lawn with a spot of non-too-violent croquet thrown in? What do you think the future holds? I doubt if you're so naive as to think that Kevin and David and Philip are going to have no sadnesses and no setbacks at all. But kind of overall, overall, what do you think it's going to be like? Overall, what with one thing and another, on balance, taking one thing and so on. Good experience being Anglican deacons and, we hope, Anglican priests in the UK. Overall, do you see it as being an upward trajectory for them, with more people in their churches at the end of their ministries than when they began? Are you optimistic for them? Or do you have secret fears for them? Perhaps fears you voiced for them and to them. When I was ordained, one of the comments that my wife made as we came out of Chichester Cathedral was that in so many ways it had been like a wedding. Lots of promises on the day, marvelous promises on the day. But what would it be like in the years to come? And that is what weddings can be like. Marvellous on the day. But what's it like in the slow grind of the matrimonial trenches in the years to come? What will it be like for our friends in the ministerial trenches in the years to come? The fear that uh, some may have that the Church of England is going down the gurgler, perhaps, the suspicion that the hostility and contempt that the chattering classes even now have towards Christianity is going to intensify. Or perhaps you have seen what can happen to an Anglican priest at the hands of a bullying church warden. 
can remember one man who, after a conversation with his church warden, had to lie down with a migraine for six hours because of the emotional impact. My, my guess is that we have all thought seriously about what the future is for our three friends here. My guess is also that our hopes, certainly our prayers for these three, is that they are used greatly by God to bless his people, to bless this church, to bless this nation. And secretly, we are optimistic, cautiously, but optimistic. But why? Optimistic. Optimistic because of what? To the eyes of a very secular media, the Church of England and Christianity as a whole does not look to have grounds for optimism. There's that old piece of street art from the first, second century in, in Rome, in Roman Pompeii, where someone kneels in worship at the foot of a cross on which there is a man with an ass's head. And that would be the view of our culture. Blasphemous cartoons didn't start with Charlie Hebdo. Right back then, the point was being made that only fools worship Jesus of Nazareth, the crucified son of God. I don't know if Stephen Fry does street art. I'm not sure it would be quite his bag. But I suspect that that's the kind he'd do. Only fools worship Jesus of Nazareth. And only an idiot, runs the secular wisdom, would buy the idea that it's worth spending your working life promoting it, as these three have just promised. So why be optimistic? Because Kevin and David and Philip are very able people, very spiritual people, no doubt. But that's no guarantee of success. And yet, optimism is right. Optimism is right. And as we look at this passage from Acts chapter 20, we can start to see why. So turn with me to uh, page 9, page uh, 10, uh, if you're doing it from the service handout, or page 11 and 20, uh, if from the church Bibles. Because what we're looking at here is a precious moment, isn't it? Paul has worked with this church in, my, in, Ephesia, in Ephesus for some time. He's built up relationships. The people have become dear to him. And now he is on his way to Jerusalem to who knows what. And they're to be left without him. No more casual stopovers in Miletus to catch up, shoot the breeze, and get the advice. If Paul is on his way to Jerusalem... Well, by now, the suspicions are that that will be a path that takes him ultimately to his death. And there is a sense in which they are on their own, or will be, very shortly, humanly speaking. It's always a testing time, isn't it, for a Christian believer when circumstances or age or health take our mentors from us. And that's what's happening here. It is a solemn moment, as well as a sad moment. And so we get Paul's famous last words to his old colleagues on his Ephesian ministry team. It's, it's a kind of closely entwined speech, isn't it? Lots of strands that kind of intermingle here and there throughout. It's very Paul, though, because the thoughts that we get here are uh, uh, very much those that we read elsewhere in the letters from him, particularly the pastoral epistles. And it weaves together, doesn't it? Particularly themes of present and past and future. Present and past and future. Past, especially Paul's past. Future, what lies in store for Paul and for the Ephesian elders. And the present what Paul and the elders must do in the light of the past and in the light of the future that they face. It's somber, it's serious, but it's also optimistic. Now, as I say optimistic, how really do you react to that as I describe this passage as being optimistic? 
when we heard it read, did it actually leave you with a smile on your face? Do you think it's optimistic? Because when our forebears chose passages like this one to mark ordinations, do you think they were being optimistic? The reason why we have to ask that question is quite simply because of one of the other things that runs through this, not just past, present, and future, but there is another theme. Blood. There is blood, and there is a threat, and the prospect of bloodshed. In the past, just have a look at it, there are the plots, verse 19, of the Jews. Blood is in the air, because we know from elsewhere that what has happened in, in the Acts of the Apostles is that these plots lead to violence. They lead to attempted lynchings. They lead to stonings. They lead to beatings, floggings. Blood is in the air. More than that, Paul knows that his journey to Jerusalem is probably going to involve blood, his blood, again. Come to that... There is a threat of blood. Just look on down. In that reference to wolves, wolves, verse 29, will come in among you, not sparing the flock. What do you think that means? What does it look like? It is a wolf sinking its canines into the jugular of a sheep. Blood. There are people, the people of God, who are being preyed on by wolves, whether those are obvious wolves from without or whether those are wolves dressed in sheep's clothing from within. Then there is the blood of the Ephesian elders themselves, of which Paul is innocent. But finally and most important of all, there is the blood of God's own incarnate son, his shed blood which is the ransom price for his church. In this way, when you stop and think about it and when you look, there's actually quite a lot of blood in this passage. And please note, this is not blood that Paul sheds. It's not blood that God sheds, and it's not blood that the church sheds. Rather, it is the church's blood, if I can put it that way. We still hear quite a lot about the violence of religion from guys like Richard Dawkins and his particular brigade, and in particular, maybe, the violence of Christianity. But actually, what is in view here is the shed blood of Christians, the shed blood of the Christ. And to be honest, that is the way of the world today. And th that is the world into which... Kevin and David and Philip have been ordained as deacons, as Stephen was. We do see the shed blood of God's people across the world, not just because of Islam either. It's this shed blood ministry that our friends are entering today. That has got to give a thinking person some kind of pause for thought, hasn't it? And it is in the light of that that what Paul says here is so precious for us. Because this is not romantic, airy-fairy, let's pretend it is all going to be croquet and thin-sliced cucumber sandwiches on the lawn. Those days are past if they were ever true. Paul knows the reality of the shed blood life of a Christian in this world and the shed blood life of a Christian minister in particular. Sometimes it will be metaphorical as you guys are pilloried for child abuse because you have dared to teach hell to the teenage youth club. Sometimes, for some of us across the world, it, will, it is and will be quite literal. Even the guardian has grasped that that is what is happening across our globe. Possibly it will even be news to the BBC soon. But don't hold your breath. So how does Paul, who is utterly realistic, warn 
and encourage those he is commissioning. This matters for many of us gathered here in this church, certainly for Kevin, for David, and for Philip, but also for the rest of us who in our time have made these same promises, the same ones that we've just heard and been ordained in the same church as these three, past, present, and future. Paul's past. As you look at Paul's past, you realize that the message is the man. The message is the man. Look at the way that his past emerges here. This is a man who can say, hand on heart, to people who would know the truth about him. Verse 33, I coveted no one, silver or gold or apparel. One of the things that is sometimes said about, uh, uh, about the church is precisely that it is only really interested in money. This is a man who does not covet. This is a man who does not prey on the people he is meant to serve. He doesn't pray in terms of money here. He's not that kind of wolf. On the other hand, uh, we know that other kinds of predatory behavior are also ruled out for the minister of God. No exploitation, no emotional abuse, no sexual abuse of power. Do not covet, and that means you are not a wolf who prays. More than that, this is a man, verse 19, who serves with all humility, with tears, through the trials. This is a man who is not self-promoting. He has a genuine love. It is a tough love, a love that is prepared to be truthful as he preaches everything that is profit, uh, profitable. Have a look at verse 20. I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable. Not what was good to hear, not what would go down well, not what would get a laugh, not what would fill the offertory bag, but what was profitable for you. He's not a wolf, is he? And that is the man. And there is no discontinuity between that man and the message that he has to preach. Because his message, look on again, verse 21, testifying both to Jews and to Greeks of repentance towards God and of faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. And when you first read that, you think, well, you know, why all the stuff about blood? If you're just talking about repentance and faith, I mean, you know, that doesn't sound sort of very controversial. No, it is profoundly controversial. It really is. And if it doesn't sound controversial to us, it is because we have lost sight of what those words actually mean and what they imply and what they demand and what they instruct. Repentance and faith is deeply controversial. If you're going to talk about repentance, repentance towards God, well, who's it for? It's going to be for Jew and for Greek. It's going to be for all, whether you are Jew or Greek, whether you are bond or free, whether you are male or female, and so on. Repentance is for all. No exceptions. And who most needs to hear it? The great second-generation ge German reformer, Martin Chemnitz, put it like this, that repentance is for those who are Pharisaic and Epicurean. He fortunately then goes on to explain what he means by Pharisaic and Epicurean. Pharisaic because they're self-righteous. Self-righteous people need to have repentance taught to them, proclaimed to them because they need to have their breach of God's law exposed to them and their need for his mercy brought home. The Epicureans, they are those who are secure. They are those who say that God will never judge. They are those who presume on God. Isn't it interesting that discussion of the sins of presumption actually tend to drop out of the church's discourse over the last 60 or 70 years. Repentance. Can you see why it matters? 
not just then in Ephesus, that there were people with pharisaical and epicurean hearts, there were people who were self-righteous, and there were people who were secure in themselves and thought that God would never judge there. Doesn't that actually describe so much of what you and I are looking at and living in? This unique secular Western combination of self-righteousness and security. Think about it. We have a prime minister who says he thinks there is a God and who thinks he knows more about marriage than the God who made him and thinks that his command is holier. And that prime minister has massive support. You've got it both there. Both the Pharisaism and the Epicureanism, the self-security. And it's not just him. Do you think there's a case for repentance being preached again? If you don't, why not? Are you content to read the kind of self-righteousness that you get in the Daily Mail or the kind of self-righteousness you do get in The Guardian and the security that you have in both? The medieval spent a lot of time thinking about the sin of presumption. I don't think it's disappeared. I think it's become so natural we no longer spot it as a sin. And we're told about faith. And faith is controversial too. Because this is not faith in us. If you're thinking about one kind of program that uh, uh, actually runs through quite a lot of our junior education, it is believe in yourself. The greatest love story you will ever know, says Whitney Houston, is your love story with yourself. Faith in oneself. And what's put before us here is something radically different because it is faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Not just faith that he is there, but faith that he is merciful. Kemnitz's comment is that you preach faith in that sense, faith in the mercy of Christ to those who are hopeless, those who have come to recognize their need and who recognize that there is nothing that they can do. Repentance and faith, a confession that I do not have those things that God requires and faith that Christ can supply not just some but all. Repentance and faith, the visible promises of God in the sacraments actually put that before us. Repentance and faith. And it's striking as we go through the 1662 service that it is repentance and faith in this Pauline way that actually comes before us. All that God has said. That's the other part of Paul's message. Why is he innocent of the blood of these people? Well, he has discharged his responsibility because he has declared the whole counsel of God. He's been humble. Humble enough not to claim that he actually knows which bits should be kept and which bits should be omitted from God's revealed truth. He is one who is content to let God be God and to speak what God has said. And he does this in every conceivable angle, whether it's in public or whether it's from house to house. He does this to every conceivable person, Jew and Gentile. That is the message and that is the man. Fellow presbyters, I have a troubled moment here. As we look at these thoughts about faith and repentance, I am compelled to ask, 
whether we have done this. Have we kept our ordination promises to do these things as we should have? If we had, why does our country know so little of the Lord Jesus Christ and his greatness and his mercy? This is still the season of Lent, a season of repentance. Perhaps repentance would actually be appropriate for us too. Because as I read these words, and I read the obligations that are implied, and as I look to the future for these three guys here, I'm thinking that their task is the harder because of the sins of omission of my generation. And for that, I'm truly sorry. We want you to be better than us. We want you to be more faithful than us. We want you, spiritually speaking, to tower above us so that the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ stands high in this land and men and women may know the blessings of eternal life. That is our dream for you. That is our prayer for you. Not that you are as we are, but that you are better. And the way to do that is to look at what Paul writes here and be like him and not so much like us. That's what you need to do. And that's what you've promised to do. Because you have promised to order your lives by the scriptures. You have promised that you believe them. Abide by those promises, we pray. We beg. Because that is the way that you can be most blessing to such a needy, parched, and dry land. Please do that. Please do that. Why is that so necessary? Well, think of the future that Paul faces. He faces a future in Jerusalem, which ultimately will lead to his death. Think, too, of the future that the Ephesian elders face. What is staring them in the face? What is staring them in the face? Verse 29, after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves will arise twisted men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. You must beware of the wolves because that is what the future holds. And you must be beware of false teachers. And the false teachers will not always be easy to spot because they will be your friends. That's what we learn here from among your own selves, verse 30. And the hardest false teacher to spot is the person you went through theological college with, the person you have led a Bible study group with, the person whose error is not obvious, but who has subtly twisted the truth because, final point, they are drawing people after themselves, not after the Lord Jesus Christ. Always ask that question, please. Am I being directed to how clever the preacher is? Am I being directed to how holy the house group leader is? Am I being directed to how magisterial someone is and what great leadership gifts they have? Or am I being directed to the blood of Christ? Watch yourselves and watch the flock. How? Model yourselves on Paul. With him, the man is the message. Be the message yourselves. Incarnate it in the way that we see Paul doing, who in his turn is simply following the servant king himself, who washes the feet of his disciples. How did Paul do it? Well, there are three things here, and with this we close. Paul, first of all, 
values Christ more than himself. Verse 24, I do not account my life of any value, nor as precious to myself, if only I may finish my course and the ministry that I received from the Lord Jesus. Christ matters more. To maintain that perspective, do again as you have promised and make the scriptures your study. Love the Lord Jesus by reading his word. Love the Lord Jesus by loving his people. But by all means, love the Lord Jesus. Because he has given you, second point, a gospel of grace. We've talked about the problems of self-righteousness, the problems of security, the problem of hopelessness. But grace meets them all. And that is why, just as we finish, preach the word of grace. Look at where Paul finishes. Verse 32, and now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, and one's tempting to th- tempted to think, ho, ho, hum, hum, same as usual, more Bible study. But it goes on. Which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. God's word is sufficient, and it is a word of grace. That is why it is so beautifully symbolic that one of the gifts given you today is a New Testament, which contains the word of grace. And that word of grace is sufficient. Preach it. Let's pray. Our loving Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are the Father of mercies. We thank you that in your great mercy you sent us your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we thank you that by his shed blood you have made a people and you have ensured that those who were no people are now your people, that those who had not received mercy have now received mercy. We thank you for these things and we praise you for them. And we pray for our brothers here and we pray for ourselves that we may be shed blood people. Those who see the value, the infinite value, the infinite worth and the infinite beauty of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we pray that as we see him, you will enable us to order our lives that we may do as your servant Paul did and preach faith and repentance, forgiveness of sins, and eternal life. Amen.